Alvaro does this for free, let's give him an awesome big hand and say welcome. So as, as I promised everybody, this is going to be an exciting night. So um, I think we should start hearing, Alvaro, you know, a bit of your background, you know, where you're born, how were you raised, what did your parents do, because that does have an effect about who you turn out to be. Basically, so where do I come from and, and uh, what is my, uh, my personal background? Yeah. Um, well, just to, to sum it up, I, um, I was born uh, in, uh, in León, in Castilla León. Uh, very close to Madrid, and I spent most of my life between uh, Leon, Asturias, and, and Madrid. And um, I was, uh, I, I, I'm a lawyer, uh, even though I don't look like one, uh, I used to. Uh, and uh, my, my, basically my parents, and uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, like you said, it's kind of uh, interesting because my father was, or used to be a, a, a politician, uh, very much into politics, and a, a politician very much from the left party, uh, from the socialist party, with a very strong uh, prejudice against uh, entrepreneurs and, and entrepreneurship. I'm not saying that just because you're from the left you have to have that, uh, that prejudice, but historically speaking, uh, he had one. So that was uh, certainly not an encouragement for me as an entrepreneur. And my mother was a, a lawyer, and they both wanted me to just to follow their steps and, and just be... Uh, you know, go to a very good school and, and become a lawyer and maybe with his contacts uh, make a career and be whatever he wanted me to be, basically. Okay. Um, so you said you were a lawyer. You, you studied law? You, you went straight out of high school and went, went for law? Uh, no. Actually, what I did is uh, I, um, I went from high school to the uh, to United States. I wanted to go to Harvard. It was my, uh, it was my dream. And uh, there I, uh, I had a person that was quite the opposite of what I had during my whole life. Uh, he was what I call a, a real true mentor. Uh, you know, those kind of people that just help you out in life and, and not have any uh, second intention, no, no uh, you know, uh, nothing, nothing to, to get uh, from it. And uh, the person that was uh, there as my family host or whatever, he, uh, as, as soon as I arrived, he gave me this huge book and he said, hey, do you know what the internet is? And uh, it was, uh, at that time, it was 1997, or, or more or less. And I barely knew what it was. Uh, and he said, hey, just read this book. I will teach you everything you need to know. I'm a serial entrepreneur, first day we met. Uh, and once you go back to Spain, uh, I think you can make a living as, as an entrepreneur and, and dealing with uh, technology. So basically, uh, what I did is I, uh, I came back from the United States after one year. I had to come back for personal reasons. And I started law there because I, I also loved law, uh, to be honest. Uh, but um, I, um, I started my first year in, in college as a, as a law student. But then I had a personal, a personal situation where uh, my uh, stepfather had a, a, a helicopter accident. He was a helicopter pilot. And uh, all of a sudden, I, I, you know, my whole career path was uh, completely uh, broken uh, because uh, I had so much family pressure, as uh, we were discussing the other day, uh, because they told me, you know, it was a traditional family. They say, hey, you're the oldest of uh, three uh, kids. Your mom just got unemployed uh, and widow. So you basically need to just quit college and get a job and, and, and support your family and maybe Get a work, get a job, an unqualified job, but you know, uh, shit happens, you know. Um, and I basically, I told her, is like, uh, I'm sorry. I know it sounds selfish. I know you probably cannot see it at this point. Uh, actually, it was it was not my mom that I told that. It was the rest of my family. My mother was actually telling me to do what I was doing, uh, to do what I was saying. And I told her, hey, you know, I, I want to become an entrepreneur. I want to make. Uh, a living out of it, I think I can manage to make a living out of it and still support you and, and my, my, my sisters uh, and my half-sister. And I, I want to do that. So basically, I, I made that choice. I knew it was crazy because I was, it was my second year in, in law school. And I decided to start a law firm uh, because I thought, well, my passion is law and my passion is IT. Uh, there are not many lawyers that actually know the internet. That is something to, that is actually starting at this point. Uh, and I knew enough law just to understand the, the, the main uh, aspects about it. And, and I knew enough lawyers to get around them and, and basically create a team 
uh, of lawyers to, to start one of the first IT or internet law firms in, in Spain uh, that uh, became, uh, fortunately, became successful after a few ups and downs also. And uh, so I did that while I was studying to become a lawyer, which of course I finally did. Uh, just, just going back in 96, 97, what was that book on internet about? I mean, <laughs> it must have been very thin or... Um, about was the it internet, programming or... It was actually, internet was probably one of the final chapters and the, the previous one was, uh, were about Afronet, Telnet, all those uh, basic first steps about uh, technology and, and IT. And the internet was the very, very, very beginning of it. Uh, and they were like HTML was basically starting at that time, and so I just basically learned it, and I thought it was uh, you know I could make a living out of it, uh, including a programming language HTML or something. Yeah, okay. I, I learned Basic and HTML. Uh, basic I, I did before, and uh, so I, I thought well uh, I could also to get money before getting the first clients as a lawyer. I did one of the you know one mistakes that you never should make, which is doing too many things at the same time. Um, so I was also developing websites to make a living and finance my, you know, the beginning of my law firm. Okay, so, so basically what transformed you into an entrepreneur was meeting this, uh, this, this mentor or this mm -hmm. host father. Um, so could, can you ask, maybe you're the, one of the best ones to ask the question, is entrepreneurship DNA or is it taught? Well, it's actually a very tough question because I, I know I know that some people think, oh yeah, you, you, uh, you're born as an entrepreneur, or even some people think the contrary. What I think is that you, uh, that entrepreneurship uh, is, uh, it's killed. It's not developed, it's killed. What I'm saying is, I'm the father of a seven-year-old girl, a little kid. She is born as an entrepreneur. Everyone, actually, it's not that some people are born as entrepreneurs, some others are not. Every single person is born as an entrepreneur. Because if you look down the skills that you need to have as an entrepreneur, basically are trial and error. I mean, how do you learn how to walk? To, 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 to manage in life, basically, it was basically trial and error, curiosity, make mistakes, learn from them, uh, having more or less creativity. Of course, there are more people, there are some people more creative than others, more people more uh, like uh, execution oriented. Of course, there are so many profiles, but in the end, entrepreneurship, it's, about, it's not about creativity, it's about persistence, creativity, uh, curiosity, and, 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 and wanting to make something out of your life. And basically what society, sometimes your family, sometimes your environment, your country, your law, I mean, there are so many other layers that, uh, that fuck it up, you know, yeah. uh, to be honest. And, 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 and I think that's, that's the way uh, my, my take on entrepreneurship. It's something that I already, I always had, I, I was selling drawings uh, as a little kid when I was seven years old. Oh, I was now selling... we're talking. So you did start very early. Yeah, early. yeah. I was. I, I had the entrepreneurial gene, as as I think we all do. Um, but it's true that you know when you hear your father saying, "Hey, just just focus, you know, just uh, study. Don't do anything else. Don't even become you know the delegate of your own uh, class or whatever the representative. Just focus on studying because depending on your grades, your effort, that's how you will get a career. You will get a, make a living. You will buy a house and, and that whole race that we are taught about in society. You know? So I think that basically uh, we, uh, you know, developing or redeveloping our entrepreneurship skills is basically a, a process of really uh, de-learning or deconstructing all the layers that have previously been put on before. I, I think that's a very, very good advice to, to tell these people sitting here who are starting out that actually what they should do is to take the layers off that environment, society, uh, education, and everything has been put on them and, and, and go more with, with what they believe in. Indeed. I yes. think it's just, uh, in the end, uh, I have a very simple paradigm of life. I think most of things are, are about love and fear and they're antagonists. And, and basically entrepreneurship is basically when love, which means not passionate love, not sentimental love. Love means like um, wanting to develop things, to create things, to progress, to, to do things. To, uh, when those things are uh, higher than the fears to actually do them, that's when you become an entrepreneur. So I think over, I mean, entrepreneurship is somehow overrated, you know. I'm sorry, but I don't think we're tigers. And if so, we are all tigers, okay? And 
because I think we're not superhumans that are braver than the others. It's just we happened to be in a, the right place at the right time and, and have the right opportunities and, and, and the right mindset, and that's it. And act on those opportunities. Of course. Because of course. many people are introduced to opportunities and they do not act on them. So I exactly. Think okay. Um, so, but before now, you, you jumped already in and you, you started your, your IT company. Um, I, I remember you mentioned you, you had a stint working with young entrepreneurs and you were even a president there. Yeah. Um, that, that must have given you an, an extremely good insight into entrepreneurship. Uh -huh. Well, the, um, the thing is, I, I mean, before I, I became the, the president of, of uh, the entrepreneurs in, in Madrid, I, it was a very long process where uh, it was a very long process as an entrepreneur and also I have to admit that being the son of a politician, I don't know about you guys, but some of us, we all want to get recognition. We all want to get, uh, get our parents happy about what we do. Uh, I think it's in our nature somehow. Uh, somehow, I mean, even if we deny it to ourselves, but somehow it's, it's like that. So I always had this conflict of, do I want to use politics to change things, or do I want to change and uh, use entrepreneurship to, to change things? In fact, when one of my trips to Cuba, I, I, I had one Santero, you know, one guy that actually tells the future, which I don't believe, but I just did it, you know, for curiosity. He, he told me that. It's like, one day you will have to choose between one of the two. Uh, okay. And he did, didn't know me. I, basically, I don't know what, how was that. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so my, my point is that uh, I started that IT company. Uh, we, uh, we, of course, I didn't get any support from my family at that time. I didn't even have the 3,000 euros uh, to start the, the company here, the incorporation. I started with 60 euros with uh, what's called a Comunidad de Bienes, you know, like a, somehow like a civil uh, partnership uh, company that you don't need those 3,000 and basically you take full responsibility for everything that happens. Um, and I did that. I, I worked in hotels at nights, so I would have some salaries um, to actually go to the bank and ask for a loan. And then I asked for a loan of 50,000 uh, euros uh, with Aval Madrid, which is a, you know, some public institution that gives you a, a warrant to ask for a loan. I got that loan. Uh, I spent it all. Uh, I was too young. I was 22 or something. And I, I basically invested everything on, on computers, on furniture, on even on flyers. <laughs> don't, don't go down on the equipment. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> terrible. Uh, and the, the interesting part of it is that uh, two, three months after we got the money and, and we spent most of it, we had the office and everything, and I got a call from someone at the office saying, hey, I'm sorry, don't get scared, but your whole office just burned, uh, the whole thing all the computers, all the furniture, everything you've been working for the past three years, even the files of the computers, it's just, right now, it's completely 100% burnt. And that was a very tough day, of course. We got together, the whole team, we were six lawyers at the time. Uh, there was one person that was speechless for, I think it was like a day and a half, that could actually talk because of the shock. Uh, and, and we decided, you know, it was our passion. We started with 60 euros. We, we did it because we, need, we loved what we, what we were doing, and we decided to continue. So one year after, uh, I, got, uh, um, I, I got back on, on my feet. Uh, we actually were meeting with the clients in, in the Palace Hotel, you know, the five-star hotel here in Madrid, telling our clients that basically our office was busy at that time and that uh, I would invite them for a coffee that, you know, it was like five years of coffee or something like that, and they heard like, you cannot imagine, each coffee. Um, and, and I told the clients, you know, I will only get paid if I succeed. That was the only way, because I was so desperate on recovering and, and getting money. And the fun part of it is that one year after, and, I, and that's why also I want to connect that with uh, entrepreneurs and the association, one year after, they, I got a call from the association of young entrepreneurs saying, hey, you've been awarded, uh, as uh, the, and I'm sorry, I'm not saying it for the ego reasons, it's just part of the story, huh? okay? You've been, I don't want to talk about my awards as, a, you know, as if it was important, but you've been awarded as the best young entrepreneur in Madrid uh, because of what you did, and you were the only, they were amazed in Naval Madrid, because you were the only stupid person that actually had a fire and still paid the loan. Uh, and you were a lawyer, so we didn't understand. Uh, <laughs> so you must be a bad lawyer. Yeah, something. you should know. <laughs> 
Um, so they gave me this, uh, this uh, award and recognition. And after that, uh, the, the promotion and the success from the media and everything, you know, back, that, back at that time, it was not that useful, you know, to have all these things. It was so powerful that uh, after having ups and downs, but, you know, in a way becoming more of an adult entrepreneur, uh, I, I sold two of my companies. Uh, I actually went on bankruptcy from, with another one. I uh, had to fire 30 people and being 26, 27 years old. And at that point, before starting my next project, I thought, well, I need, you know, to give back what I got uh, from that association because I truly believe that entrepreneurs need, need to be enforced. And at that time, the image of an entrepreneur was not of a tiger. It was a, of a, you know, a person that is actually trying to get rich no matter what and, and okay. whatever. So I became the president. of. I, I just that. want to go back a little bit on, on um, when that fire happened because I think, I think there's some lessons that could be learned and taught here. Um, because for sure we know that whoever is going to start something, they're going to feel and meet setbacks mm -hmm. and devastations like you would completely burn. So where, where should they find that courage to get up 8 o'clock next day and go to an office that they don't have and, and continue? Where would you suggest to...? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's... I mean, I can only talk for myself, uh, from my own experience, but obviously I had a few setbacks where I... Uh, you know, either my office was literally burned or my company was uh, theoretically or, uh, you know, uh, metaphorically burned. Uh, and my life also was, meta I mean, metaphorically burned and I also had to be an entrepreneur. And, and if I have to think about, you know, what kept me up when, you know, when money could not be an incentive because it was so far away from the, the, the daily basis, you know, because I had to first to recover and then see to make money, uh, when, uh, when having fun was not even a motivation, like, you know, playing with your people at the office because you had to fire one person every day and, and you know, and, and, and maybe you haven't paid your employees in two months and, and it's very hard uh, to look at, at your employees that in the end are your friends. Um, and basically, I think there, there are two things. First is, is something with yourself, no matter if it's uh, the change you want to make in the world and all those beautiful things, yes, but in the end, it's with yourself. It's like, you know, it's a matter of resilience. And I think that whoever is not feeling that has the, that resilience within himself or herself, then uh, maybe in becoming an entrepreneur, it's not, it's not your thing. And also, it's because the, uh, it's true that the impact, the, the project, the, the dream you're trying to build has to be... Uh, big enough, you know. Um, Elon Musk uh, uh, mentioned one day the what I what he called the the massive transformation purpose. Uh, the bigger it is, the the more it helps you to to actually uh, keep on track and keep on going and and set back. Definitely, um, we're still on the personal of Alvaro. So you mentioned some point you had a daughter and 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 also that your personal life was on fire. Uh, can you share a little bit, because it, not in details, we don't need that, but, but it is just that um, being an entrepreneur is 24-7 is and nothing will change that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have to add children and, and uh, parents and uh, spouses and everything else to it. So mm. a little bit about... Well, I mean, I think it's... I mean, I don't mind uh, whoever knows me knows I'm, I try to be very transparent because uh, I think that's something that many people lack of and that's why we're fooling ourselves so much. Um, so the truth is that yes, uh, when I, uh, you know, I went in one year, I was uh, 27 years old, 28, I, I don't remember, and I was seeing, you know, my, uh, myself at that time as a secretary general of the Young Entrepreneurs, having three companies, more than 30 employees, big house, baby was coming, recently married with a beautiful and wonderful uh, woman, and um, so my ego, you know, was actually going up, you know, it's, it's very difficult to control your ego. Uh, and I think you need a few, uh, a few setbacks. Uh, setbacks like that to put it in its place, you know. So ego, it's to me one of the things that I would re recommend you to really keep under control. It's, you know, uh, it, can, it can lead you to disasters in, in your life. Uh, or surround yourself with people with the wrong uh, ego. So I went from there. Um, to actually one year after lose everything and be so concerned about, you know, my, I mean, saving my own fire at my own company that I was actually burning my own fire at my own house without knowing. 
Uh, so basically, I, I actually completely, um, you know, ignore my responsibilities as a father, uh, as a husband, as a, or as a couple, as a partner, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I basically got so much into having this idea of yourself as a hero that is trying to recover from your ashes and everything that actually, you know, the woman that was next to me, I was like, hey, what the hell, you know? So basically, I, I got divorced, uh, and it was, a, it was like a very... I, I, I know many entrepreneurs that have been through that, and they just don't say it. We make uh, horrible partners. We are terrible partners. So... Uh, I think it's about expectation management also. <laughs> yes. um, but if we're so over-optimistic that we lie to ourselves and then we project uh, those things to our uh, partners. So yes, I, I uh, had a very um, uh, difficult uh, divorce, but I also wanted to become a, you know, uh, I learned from that and you know, I wanted to actually be a father. So we have like two weeks, I have my daughter and my ex-wife has uh, all the two weeks. And, you know, I think it's, uh, if, you, if you let me, if I can tell you one thing that I would like to share, you know, I, I'm not into much uh, this self, I mean, uh, personal development uh, cliches, okay? But it's this guy, Stephen Covey, uh, he has, he's got very good points uh, sometimes, and he wrote a book about uh, something that he said, first things first, okay? And he actually said, hey, if you try to make you know, um, if you try to put big stones and then smaller and smaller and smaller and sand and water in a jar, and you start putting the sand and the small and the and the others in the jar, when you by the time you want to put the big stones, they don't fit. But if you want to actually make things fit in the jar, uh, the first thing is to keep your you know to identify your f the biggest three stones in your life, put them in the jar, and then. From there, get the smaller and the smaller, and then the sand, and then the water. And that's how things fit. And I think if I recommend you, if I can give you somehow, not an advice, because I hate advice, everything need, everyone needs to live its own life. But if I can share a personal learning is that, um, you know, uh, as he said, keep the main thing as the main thing, uh, which basically is find your big stones and make sure they're always in the jar no matter what. And I wanted to keep my daughter as a, as a big stone. And, and, and I don't know why, but uh, you know, everything seems to work after. Uh, so yeah. don't, don't lie to yourselves thinking I'm too busy to be an entrepreneur and, and be a, a responsible or a father or whatever. Um, and I, I like talking about this because uh, entrepreneur, we, we shouldn't talk about business. And, and you're business. a father as well. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and it is just important because having a, starting a company it is like having a baby, mm -hmm. and um, deciding on on who comes first, your wife or your baby or your business baby, it's impossible. So um, don't fool yourself. I'm talking to you that with the work-life balance, that's BS. It's called work-life integration. I mean, you have a life with your spouse, and you have your work, and these are all three things that once 24 hours of your your day. So mm -hmm. it's about integrating these things. Be clear expectation management, saying, babe, I'm going to do this from these two hours, and then I'm yours, and whatever it is, you know, but, but being very open and upfront. Indeed. And it's just important for, for these people setting out mm -hmm. to know as well. I think so. Great. Um, so after the, the law firm and um, young entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. what then? Well, what then? Um, okay. Put yourselves in the situation where I'm going through a divorce. Uh, at that point, I'm a semi-public figure in the ecosystem. Okay, so I mean, many entrepreneurs they knew me because you know it was the association was, uh, you know, just basically because the ecosystem is very small. Okay, uh, so um, and it, and we like to gossip and we like to you know, it's especially in Spain. So so basically, I was going through a divorce. And I had, you know, one of the companies on bankruptcy. I was, uh, I had, ma I had managed to sell uh, my other two companies, so I could have two years basically to do what I wanted, uh, just to make sure of, you know, choosing my next project. And the thing is, I was looking at myself in the mirror, and and I was, you know, one one uh, sentence uh, at that time. Steve Jobs was not that overused as he is now. Uh, he said, you know, if you look at yourself in the mirror too many days and you don't like what you see, uh, maybe it's time to make a change, okay? 
And it was not about a hair implant, okay? <laughs> it was about uh, basically uh, that I was, I was thinking to myself, I became a politician. I became, uh, Your you know, father. I became my father. <laughs> and I became, uh, this is all Freudian here. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. Um, no, I became, a, I became a politician. I, I you know, I'm supposed to represent uh, 18,000 entrepreneurs. Um, and I have no company at the time. It's true that I, you know, I created three to five, six companies before. No one was going to question that. But I, did, I felt like a failure uh, or like a farsante, I don't know how do you, like a fraud. imposter, a fraud okay. or whatever. Okay. okay. And I thought, okay, it's time, to, it's time to quit. It's time to start something new. That's when I managed to, uh, I, to, to, to start from, from zero and, and, and from my ashes. And uh, I, I started to look for new ideas to think about. But as a person in this small ecosystem, I had the pressure, I guess the same pressure that a writer feels when he's published a certain amount of novels, and some of them are good, some of them are, them are worse, and you don't want to uh, disappoint you know, with your next idea. You know, you get a lot of pressure, it's what's going to be my next idea? It has to be good enough, it needs to be, you know, I cannot fail at this point. Um, and I couldn't afford to fail either. So I was starting to look for all these ideas that I had, and all of them um, seemed to be taken. And I thought taken at that time as something that, oh shit, I cannot do this because someone has already done it. Which was very stupid uh, because it actually validates uh, the business model and you just need to execute it better or make it in a different uh, market. Um, so, but then I went one step farther and say, hey, okay, I know that I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, and I've been struggling for so many uh, months to actually come up with an idea. So I think the big hypothesis here is that it needs to be a change of paradigm. You don't need to have an idea to be an entrepreneur. And I learned that the hard way. It was not a hypothesis in a coffee shop, you know. Uh, it was something that I suffered myself. And I had to become an entrepreneur and not have an idea for a few months and realize that the entrepreneurial gene was not within the idea. So uh, I said, wow, there's so many people out there that have the entrepreneurial skills. They just need an idea to, you know, to uh, catalyze or to unleash all this entrepreneurial um, potential. So I, I said, okay, I think I can help entrepreneurs in many ways. I'm motivated to do that, not as a politician anymore. Took my tie off, took my suits off, uh, shaved my head, made a tattoo. It was like a personal crisis, of course. And um, yeah, it's, it's a personal crisis. Uh, and I started Sonar Ventures. And basically it was a company, it was a venture builder that actually would help other peoples with certain passions to create companies. And I would become their partner, not a consultant, their investor, co-investor and, and, and co-founder. And basically if they were technicians, I would help them out with everything else they needed. If they were lawyers, I would help them out with everything else they needed. I call that liquid building. I basically, I would fill the gaps of all the initial uh, lacks of any, uh, any startup at the beginning or any entrepreneur. And I would find business ideas that would be working in other countries, other markets, and align them with their passion. So if you had passion about kids, about cooking, about sports, Whatever, I would look for a successful business model in another country, and I would start it in Spain and then move from other markets. That was Sonar Ventures. That still Fantastic. is. Fantastic. Okay, you, you touched a little bit on, on your role. So your role sort of is defined by what is missing. Basically, I think it's first to, to, to actually uh, start the, the ignition, uh, not myself, but with the entrepreneur. I partner with them, we go for, uh, I don't know, for a retreat and uh, like a weekend and we meet each other since we're going to be partners. We, uh, we see what our passions uh, we share and what types of ideas we could do together. And then we invest around like 200,000, uh, 150, 250,000 euros per, uh, per idea. Um, and uh, we just ask the entrepreneur to get a either no salary or very small salary at the beginning. And that's their investment, their time, which is probably even more valuable than our money. Uh, and we become co-founders, 50%, 50%. If there are two co-founders and us, we is like 33% each. Um, and we become equals. And then we just have different roles. 
Um, and, and how is Sona Ventures funded? You said some of your own exit money, or have you? Have it you was gone my out? it was my personal money. Uh, then I had some uh, friends that invested like a uh, hundred thousand. Um, so that's how we bootstrapped the company at the beginning. And then we have now 15 partners, 15 investors from all different backgrounds. And uh, of course, then each project is funded by itself. I mean, once you get a project uh, ongoing, then you got your own investors with that, with that project itself. So, so how do you choose? I mean, so you go on a retreat, uh, mm -hmm. you like the idea, but the guy sucks. Mm -hmm. um, or the other way around. How would you go about that? Well, that's why I try not to get people's, I, I, I try not to listen to people's ideas. And, and let me tell you why. If you come up with an idea, I think maybe I can help you more with an accelerator, okay? I, I'm very skeptical with uh, the acceleration uh, model, but, um, but it's true that uh, in some cases it's very useful. Um, but if, what I need is a person that has just different ideas, but not, doesn't have any strong thoughts or feelings about one because otherwise he or she will always feel that has more ownership than than I do and I want to start from equal partnership you know um, otherwise it's it's very uh, it's very complicated for us so we basically share the passion for example last uh, startup food in the box one of my companies uh, Fabian Leon he became finalist uh, in a master chef he came to the office and he said hey I didn't even know, I didn't even know, I haven't even watched uh, MasterChef, but, uh, but uh, he said, I love cooking, but I don't want to spend my whole life uh, behind uh, a, a cooking uh, or a restaurant or whatever. I know what it is and I don't want to do that. And I want to become an entrepreneur and I want to confess to you that I've read more books about marketing than about cooking. I didn't know that. So we went for a weekend and we, uh, we um, talked a lot, we met each other and I said, okay, uh, what are the main problems in the world that might have an impact that we might solve with cooking, uh, thanks to cooking? And we came out, we reached the conclusion that um, uh, obesity is the actually second cause of death in the world, that the main cause of that is not lack of exercise, which of course helps, but is uh, actually bad eating habits. And the main issue with that is because people don't cook at home. We cook, I mean, we eat so many, so much shit, uh, you know, in our daily lives just because we don't cook it. Doesn't mean that we need to buy lettuce and, and, and broccoli every day. No, just normal food and cook it ourselves. And that's why Jamie Oliver, uh, he called that the food revolution. That's why he's making kids and adults cooking. But we found out that people that, um, is, so we started to talk about, like, why do you think people don't cook? He actually went on a road show and talked for hundreds of people about, hey, I love your show, but I don't cook because I have no time. Or, you know, I have time to watch you, but I don't have time to cook, which is kind of weird. But um, so basically, we started to analyze the problems and we developed that company. He became the co-founder. We started a team. We got funded and uh, we went up and running. Um, I think that's a very unique model, and I, I really like uh, the way forward. Thanks. I mean, it's it's um, it, it's at the essence of entrepreneurship, you know, mm -hmm. finding the right person that has the right mindset, but open enough to to allow you know your ideas and and exactly. adding to it. Great. Um, so, so with these these projects that you take on board, um, are they always you know with an you know, we're going to build it to some point and we're going to sell it, or is there any mm -hmm. long-term strategy with, with, with these companies? Um, well, of course, I'm, I'm not going to say that we don't have an exit strategy on the startups. Um, otherwise, my 15 investors in Sonar Ventures, they would kill me. It's like, uh, hey, I mean, yeah, it's fun that you do things, you create value, but in the end, we want to get our money, return not just capital. back, but we want to return uh, our capital. So. But I think it's, and I'm sure you, you, and I'd like actually to know your approach on that. Um, you know, entrepreneurs have to have exit in mind, but it's not, I mean, it's not the objective. It just comes when you create enough value, it just happens, you know? But if you have the mindset of, I need to build an exit, that's too much of a speculative um, approach or paradigm that in the end it, it translates into your daily actions, your daily mindset, your culture, your company culture, everything. So um, I think that of course we know that in the end an exit will come, 
Um, but uh, it's not our main objective. No. I, I take it down even a further level. I, I tell people and, and our, our organization, if we focus every day on building the best product and listening to our customers on every single day and integrating what we have learned from them, the result of building the best product that they would like is that it's going to be big and successful. And when you are that, someone's going to come in. So you know, we don't get up every day and, and look at an exit. We get up every day to make the best product and integrate what we have learned yesterday. Exactly. Just think that Twitter, it's now trying to be acquired. I mean, there's always someone going to be bigger than you. So just by knowing that, uh, you will probably be more interesting uh, for someone else, apparently, that might want to buy you. and. And, you know, maybe it's the right time for you to get away. You know, I'm not a good manager. I mean, I'm a good starter of companies, uh, I think, or I try to be. But I, I'm not, I cannot make a company to go to a series B, C, and D. Uh, I don't feel You're comfortable that with that suit. It, it goes back to ego, actually, and, and knowing who you are. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Um, one question, because I heard you mentioned um, you did not like the accelerator model and stuff. So what is your take on mentorship? What, what do you put in that and, and building companies and helping them develop? Well, I think it's a very good question because mentorship, uh, it's, um, it's been uh, actually mis misnamed or misused, uh, the, the term mentorship. You call mentors, some people in the accelerators, that they take an equity, uh, some equity of your company, which could, it's fair enough, but just don't call it mentor because I think it's something more of a consultant that is uh, charging you for sweat equity. And let's call things the way they are, you know? Um, you know, I can be a lawyer and I can charge you 100 euros an hour. Or I can say, you know, five hours, $500. Um, I don't... 2% you don't have of your company. 2% of your company, whatever. And that's fair enough. I'm not your mentor. Um, mentorship is what I think that I experienced in the United States. When you got someone that doesn't know you and actually introduces to the best people in Harvard to just to help you out to get there, to give you a book on internet and 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 and, and also to to get a job at his company where he was the manager, he had like 300 people and start cleaning toilets, uh, literally cleaning toilets or taking folders. Uh, it was in Boston, so it was like snowing all the time and after college, after class I would just go from and just take folders from one truck to uh, to another and just start from there to cut come manufacturing and you know a person that is willing to teach you that and really inspire you by what he is uh, or what you know uh, he cares about you is a true mentor and I think that uh, we should find our mentors in life I think that's one of the few things that really help you out but just don't miss Confu you know, don't confuse mentors with accelerators. Um, I think that I think that's also a very very good advice. Um, let's go away a little bit. Where where do you see in Spain and maybe also in Europe? You've been in, you've been still uh, a long time in Europe. So where in Spain do you see the barriers to entrepreneurship? I think the the barriers are basically cultural. You know, to be honest, I, I know there's a correlation between uh, bureaucracy and, or an inverse correlation between bureaucracy and entrepreneurship. That's a fact. It's not an opinion. It's the general entrepreneurship monitor that is saying that. But they also say that in Spain, particularly, we are the second country in the world with the highest fear of failure. And actually, is the biggest stopper uh, for us to become entrepreneurs. Once again, love and fear, you know? It's not coincidence that the main cost against entrepreneurship is fear. Let's, let's be honest. You know, if you didn't start a company because instead of taking one week, it would take you two months to incorporate, and you didn't become an entrepreneur because of that, I mean, are you a real entrepreneur? Honestly. I mean... Those are just small roadblocks. Yeah. That's not just even. the beginning. You don't even know what it's going to happen after, you know? Um, so I think that that victimist approach is not helping entrepreneurship ecosystem, you know, complaining to politicians, which I agree, of course, and I, I think that the less barriers the better. But I think that we should promote uh, innovation, that's a cliche, but innovation in the end is we should just uh, forgive or even enforce failure. And, and that's why um, 
you know, the, company, the, the countries that have this more of a failure approach uh, are the most successful and the most innovative and the most entrepreneurial. Absolutely. Great. Um, uh, let's go on a lighter side now. So we, we need to get over and have the mics with the, with the audience as sure. well. So um, I promised them we will talk tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> you had to show yours. No, no, I, I'm not going to. But, but um, the ones you can show. Huh? <laughs> okay. So um, they, they say actually you are a million miles away from your first and you are one step from your second. Absolutely. And I What's the story am. with your uh, tattoo on your hand there? Well, this is a, this is a phoenix bird, okay? Um, as you all know, is the, is the bird that actually overcame from, from the ashes and its own ashes and whatever. And I did that when I was 30 in this uh, personal crisis that I had. And um, so it was not just something I did when I was 16 and I wanted to be cool. On a drunk know? night. <laughs> On a drunk night. No, that was this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so actually that's a phoenix. And also here there's uh, two letters hidden that says if. If, uh, who knows the if poem from Rudyard Kipling? Uh, okay. So if, if you check it out on Google, I honestly really recommend it because it's one of my uh, guidelines in life. For people that don't believe in God like me, or even for people that believe in God, that don't ha I don't have a, an ethical uh, framework, uh, I think that it's pretty much one of the best approaches to what I think a person like an, or an adult or the, the, or the message that I, will, I would like to send to my daughter in life uh, to be, uh, I mean, to, to, to take into account. So I just didn't want to forget uh, any day of my life that entrepreneurship and life is about, you know, uh, fucking, it up, fucking it up and, and just get up and running and always with your uh, right ethical approach uh, integrated in yourself. Great. Um... Alvaro, what? No, no, but what about yours? Come on. Ah. <laughs> okay, I... Uh, Show the Illuminati, please. Uh, I have a... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have one that looks like the Illuminati, but I am not Illuminati. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, it's, it is more symbolizing of the third eye and, and being able to, uh, uh -huh. to believe in, in what the universe is sending you of energy. And I have another one, which is... Um, it's something you realize later on in life, and you, and you have shared it very well. It's that... You do realize that um, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. And you were supposed to meet that person. You were supposed to go there. And so when you look back in life, suddenly you see that all your stars are aligning. And you say, ah. Oh. And, and once you do that and you realize that stars actually are aligning, you're actually becoming more um, open and more open-minded and, and, and saying, oh, maybe I should pursue that connection. Or maybe I should, instead of being blindfolded and just believing that you know everything yourself. So another one is, is a lot of stars that is actually aligning and there's a line going through the stars. Well, mine now, the, the one that you said that is very one step away, um, I'm just sketching it, it's, it's about a wolf. Um, okay. a wolf means, uh, I associate that with fear. And I think that what I'm dealing now, it's more about how important actually fighting against fear uh, is in your life. You know, fear is present in basically 90% of the decisions you take every single day. When you want to call someone, you want to ask for a ticket for your startup. Uh, when you it's want limits to, you. It uh, limits you so much. And in the end, it's not about fighting the wolf, it's just riding the wolf. Uh, and and I uh, so I'm trying to. There's a Twitter quote there. <laughs> so basically, um, you know, it's not also saying no. Oh, the wolf is not real. No, no, the wolf is real. I mean, the situation has a, a stake, has a risk, and and of course, it's, it's it can be it can limit you. But you need to write it. You basically need to control it. You need to uh, to um, to 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 understand it. So I, I think that uh, I think my my. Probably my next step of uh, personal development is how to, you know, really develop, how to get in touch and, and, rela and relate uh, the right way with, uh, with the fear, basically. Right. You're playing straight into my next question. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, share with us a bit of the book you're reading. It started with a book, uh, uh, Internet for Dummies in 96. <laughs> <laughs> what, what books is it today? Uh, well, um, I love, uh, well, I used to love novels, but I don't read them in that much anymore, I have to admit. 
because of the lack of time and and it's not of my not one of my big stones at this point I have to admit but uh, I love science fiction books I love Isaac Asimov's and the foundation is one of my favorite books I read it every once in a while as you were talking I was uh, remembering uh, one book that I don't know how to translate this la, la insoportable levedad del ser the uh, the, the yeah, the unsupportable like likeness of being. Um, I read it also every once in a while because it helps me. It has a, a very it's a philosophical novel that I I I, I love to to read every once in a while. And uh, at this point, I like Osho. Uh, okay. Uh, Osho is also a very good writer. Uh, he he was from Pune, where you've actually recently I have uh, been. Not visit recently, but I have lived yeah. in his ashram for a week. Uh, excellent, and he has a lot of a uh, very good mindset because he combined all the uh, ethical approaches, religions, mystic uh, approaches, uh, also Krishnamurti and so many others. So I like to read all that and uh, and essays, you know, about uh, politics, about uh, international relations. And okay, is there is there any blocks or stuff like that that you could you know throw that is a good place to go for inspiration, entrepreneurship, or management? Or well, this is okay. Uh, it, it's good. Uh, that I have the chance to actually say that because it's funny. Uh, I don't want to recommend any specific blog, probably that you don't know. There are like a few that I would recommend you. For example, uh, Two Sides of the Table is one of them. Uh, it's about both. relationships. Huh? Not both sides of the table. Both sides of the table. Yeah, both yeah. sides of the table. I think it's really, really good. It talks about the relationship between co founders. He's been an, an entrepreneur and an investor, and yeah. it's very good. But this is something that I, I recommend you to do. At least it worked for me so well. Okay? This is what I do, or what I did three weeks ago. I was uh, tired of, I'm sorry, but of seeing all these updates on my Facebook of my friends' kids. Um, every time they take a bath or they go for a dancing lesson or whatever and uh, you know or people just uh, showing off what they were doing on a daily basis to project a happier life in the than, posts than they actually do no so what I did is I unfollowed 90% of my thousand friends uh, I mean they're still my friends it's just that I don't follow and what I did is I went I chose the mo the 50 most interesting people uh, in my whole Facebook list, okay? Uh, and I look for them, just not interesting in terms of intelligence. Some of them are like, I mean, minds. Others are just people that are living uh, in an echo uh, village. Others are um, artists, you know? Just interesting people that uh, enrich me, okay? Uh, so I, I become a stalker and I go to their profile and I go to their likes. And I see all the things they've liked since they actually started in Facebook. And I, uh, so I pick, the, because I think if they're interested and I actually have very fluent conversations with them, I'm most likely to be interested about it. So the best RSS feed or the best um, compel, compilation of uh, information that I get now is that I, I, I turned my Facebook into a, Basically, an RSS feed of the people that are feel more attracted about, uh, in, uh, interested about, just by uh, following the same things that they are following. Long link Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I think we should give the uh, microphone, or sure. Can you shout your questions, and then you can keep the microphone. Or you can have the microphone. I can yeah. shout. No big deal. Question is about um, what is so. about gut feeling, and and. Can you trust it, and should you trust it, and, and Alvaro's take on God feeling? Well, I, I can give you my, my personal experience of that, uh, about that. Um, I think gut feeling is not a mystical approach. I mean, your unconscious basically is uh, handling more information than your neocortex or your conscious. Uh, um, but, it's, but you need to do th two things. I mean, first you need to feed the information. You know, I don't believe that entrepreneurship should be an act, a result of intuition. It's not about that. It's about getting so much information, so much work, so much inputs, and then let your intuition uh, do the work and, and trust your own intuition that they will give you the right output. So I think the times that, you know, we go, I think we all do. We go, sometimes we feel more connected with ourselves. Sometimes we don't feel like we are, you know, what we actually want to be you know so i think the the times that we're more aligned uh you know uh, your 
your conscious and your unconscious are more aligned as well. And, and basically, it's not like acting by intuition. It's like acting in an aligned way. Now, I, I don't know who actually said that. I, I'm not sure if it was, I don't know, a, a very interesting guy, but I'm not, I don't remember. Um, he said intuition is what happens when you, know, when you throw a coin and, and the first uh, thing you want to, uh, to make it on the table, the first thought, the first image uh, is coming uh, to your mind. And, and that's the, you know, the quick thought. But that quick thought, once again, is, is about the inputs you've, uh, you've made. So yes, follow your intuition, but with uh, information before. Actually, there is uh, the, after the brain, the place in your body with the most nervous system and sensors is in your stomach. Mm -hmm. So it's not bullshit that the, there is a gut feeling. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. And the second question was, uh, sorry? Uh, the was the what? Horoscope. Oh, I'm a Leo. Okay. <laughs> a Leo from Leon. Leon, exactly. <laughs> Next questions? Yeah. Corporate culture. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for that question because it gives me the chance to to say something I learned about my experience at Sonar Ventures. At the beginning, I wanted to create what I call a startup factory, and I I made a collection of 200, 300 processes that were common in every startup, and I thought I thought I could industrialize. So basically, it would be like, you know. So then I thought, oh yeah, I'm building companies. Then I read this sentence, that quote, that inspired me. He was it was from a guy named Siglar, uh, uh, that he said, "We don't build business; we build people, and then people build the business." And it was a mindset change. Okay, of course, it doesn't happen overnight. It's been something you've been thinking about, and and it's you know your life doesn't change for one quote. Um, and, and that gave me the, the, the shift of paradigm uh, where I just focus on building the right teams. And by that, I mean building the right culture. There's this book called uh, Culture Eats a Strategy for Breakfast uh, that I recommend you, uh, that is really good. What it says, you know, the most successful companies are the ones that have the strongest culture. And, and of course, yeah, I, I totally agree that the culture is the essence of a, of a company and the, the real DNA of, a, of, a, of future success. And uh, it has to have its own values. You know, I, I'm not anyone to say, you know, they should have this and that or whatever. Uh, my companies, I call that a team of teams because we have a, a meta culture in Sonar Ventures and each different team or each different startup shares its own different culture. Um, but of course, uh, I think that you would not be surprised if I told you that transparency is on my top. Um, of course, uh, transparency, perseverance is one of my uh, top as well. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, um, also the analytical aspect of it, you know, I've seen cultures that don't measure what they do and, and it's not that romantic. But in the end, you're just, that is gut feeling. You know, if you have to run that company for just gut feeling, you're, you're screwed. Uh, you need to have metrics. So you, you need to have the right balance between passion and execution. Uh, if you don't have both sides, then uh, you're unbalanced. Just to answer that, culture is not as in Google with free lunches, uh, masseur, and someone to pick up your dry cleaning. That's, that's not culture. Culture is the values that the team works together on, whether it's customer-centric or development-centric or how you solve problems together. That's your culture. That's what you need to feed into this grain. You know, The other things are just benefits. And, and of course, encourage in, in empowerment and autonomy in people. You know, Let people uh, make mistakes. Uh, give, uh, give people that. And, and it works so well, even from a tactical point of view, because people are not used to actually uh, mm, Having this response, I mean, someone really trusts them, uh, you know, more than what is expected, and and it's called the Pygmalion effect. You know, people are actually also acting depending on the on the perception that others have of them, uh, and I think that if you have this Pygmalion effect on your own team by expecting a lot from them and giving, the, of course, the responsibilities and the right to fail, I think that normally leads to good stuff. We had a question over there. Insights. 
I'll just repeat the question. The question is uh, that in order to start a company, you need to know a lot about law. So the question is whether Alvaro's law degree or whether that statement mm. uh, stands. Mm. Okay. Um, I think a, an entrepreneur needs to know a little bit about everything and be surrounded by the best people on everything. So just know enough about law to talk to the best lawyers you can get surrounded with. Um, that would be my advice. As for my personal experience, I tell you, I've made mistakes uh, that, I mean, they would throw me out of law school. Uh, I signed some shareholders agreement that in the end, yeah, from a legal point of view, they were perfect. But then I got one of my partners just, uh, you know, um, copying my own company uh, and starting it in, you know, in a different place. And all the legal issues in the end, let, let me put it this way, when you have to fight in legal processes as an entrepreneur, that could be the beginning of the end. So sometimes it's better to let go and it's better to say, okay, I don't want to get into this legal battle. I just prefer to move on and not let that create friction on your daily basis. And, and just, uh, of course, you will lose more things that probably you could get on the short term. But in the end, it, it leads you to have more focus on the long term. So I think just be careful when you sign a shareholders agreement. That's one of the key issues to be taken care of. But be more careful just choosing the right partners. And that you don't have to be a lawyer for. Uh, and just in my case, I, I don't even have a high school degree. And I've started maybe 10, 12 companies and exited, I don't know how many, you know, I mean, so it's not that you need to have that educational background, it's, that's not, you shouldn't let education hold you back. Even sometimes it's, it's even counter uh, productive, you know, they say the best scientists in the world, starting from Newton, they didn't go to, you know, uh, they, didn't, they, want, they didn't want to learn certain aspects of physics or mathematics because otherwise they would be limited by that framework or that knowledge. So I'm not saying try to hide or run away from knowledge. Of course not. You need to read every day and be informed. This mentor that I was talking to you about, um, that he was like, he became like my father. And he ended up having cancer and he was giving me so many advices. He didn't finish high school. He was beaten, beaten when he was a kid. He became a drug addict. He became a drug dealer. He went to jail. He, uh, he actually um, had a, he, he's a whole, I mean, his father was an alcoholic. His brother was an alcoholic. Uh, I mean, he came from a tough neighborhood and uh, he started, uh, you know, uh, his company uh, by just working hard, working hard, working hard. And he became a honoris causa from, uh, from one of the best, uh, top uh, universities in, in his area because um, in the end, he, I remember him watching CNN at 4 a.m. in the morning, you know, saying, you just know, to learn. just to learn and reading books. And, you know, degrees are over, overrated. Not a good Twitter. No, you can tweet it. It's okay. <laughs> Christian? Yeah. Yes. Okay, um, that if I had to tell you, I could give you both, both uh, in two, two, um, two answers. One as an entrepreneur, and other as my previous past of uh, representative of entrepreneurs. That actually, when I started uh, my presidency, I, I focus on the Babson. You know the the university. They have this. Um, they have a framework of what an entrepreneurial ecosystem should have. Okay, you, you can look it up, the Babson Entrepreneurship uh, Model, okay? And, he, uh, and they talk, they have this infographic where they talk about uh, the policy, the investors, the culture, education, uh, the market, 
uh, they have, uh, I mean, so many, uh, I mean, certain, certain aspects, but basically are, are those, okay? And in the end, if I told you, what do you need to do uh, in Spain? I think, honestly, is is a matter of uh, you know I think politicians can basically do anything about do nothing about it. I think it's something that it's within us, and it's a cultural change. We uh, we thought we did it, and I thought I think it was it's a big mistake with the crisis. We started to create all these programs for entrepreneurs, as if we had the responsibility to take the country, uh, you know, from the crisis and and leave the politicians. Uh, with no responsibility for it, you know, and make uh, entrepreneurship as an exit for unemployment. And that's not the right mindset to me. You, you're leaving people to failure, basically. They don't have the right personal situation to be entrepreneurs, so to become entrepreneurs. That's my point. So I think it's something more uh, universal that you, it cannot be made by intelligent design, like in other countries like Israel or or in Stanford when it started in California, I, I don't think it can be the, it can be done like that. I think it's more on you know the media uh, cannot only put uh, news on the newspapers about the the bad entrepreneurs uh, or you know schools cannot punish uh, failure uh, so much or even kindergarten uh, should not you know constrict and limit your education in in so many ways. So it's such a you know, um, broad um, and complex problem. And I've, honestly, I was naive enough to try to think, uh, to solve it, at least in Madrid. And I thought, I would have so many business schools, the weather, the, the salaries, the, the people, the, everything, everything. But I think it's something that needs time and, and organic development, and time will tell. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Okay, yeah. you, you're not trying to get me uh, enemies with accelerators around here, right? Um, no, actually, I, I, I have no problem on saying that because I told that to the main accelerators in Spain and we're friends and, and I just tell them, I'm sorry. It's like, I don't believe in your model. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, let me, once again, I can be completely wrong and if anyone here has an accelerator or whatever and wants to have a, a chance also to to uh, make his or her point, just just tell me. But let me just tell you, okay, what is the added value of an accelerator? If you think, if you deconstruct it, okay? You have free space, okay? Come on, today's a commodity. You can have a startup in so many places, I mean, for three, four, five people. That space is nice, but you can start a startup from the Starbucks. You know, at home, uh, my, my office was burned and I was more productive when we were like the whole team working f with, you know, from our places and meeting once a day in my house and in a coffee shop than just working at the office all day. So basically that I don't think is part of the added value. It's nice to have, but it's not part of it. Uh, then you need uh, skills and knowledge about lean startup, customer development and all that. Honestly, I think it's a bit of bullshit. Because it's like Antonio said, you cannot show a picture of a tiger and say, you know, you're a tiger. I'm saying that there are resources like, for example, he was talking about that you can learn by yourself just by getting access to that knowledge. You know, read books. There are courses at Udemy, at, uh, at his, uh, what was the name again? Mashari. Mashari. Uh, that you can actually download, that you can view and, and get uh, your own knowledge about it. So to me, check, you don't need that for. The, the third is mentorship. Honestly, if you need mentors, mentors, you know, don't work in such a systematic way. You know, it's like, oh, this is your, you know, if I became a mentor of an accelerator and say, hey, you need to be a mentor of that person, it's like, why? If I'm a true mentor, it's like, I need to believe in that person. I need to actually share his values or her values. And maybe he or she doesn't share mine either. So if you're an entrepreneur, I would say just create your own advisory. And, and, and it could be even your father, your best friends, and some others, the leaders of your industry, whatever. People are willing to help more than you could imagine. And the, the, the more successful they are, 
the less they will ask for. Okay? So, to me, advisory, it's also a commodity in that way, from an accelerator point of view. Then you got the access to finance and, and investment. I don't know too many, honestly, yeah? uh, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know too many projects that got funded because they went on a demo day pitching to investors and they say, oh, like a talent show, you know, I like your pitch, let's meet and I will invest. That happens on very, very few places, very few times, very few occasions. The way investors get their deal flow, deal flow is by recommendations of other entrepreneurs where they've invested, other investors where they co-invest with, or people that approach to them on a very audacious and, 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 and brave uh, attitude and that feel passion in their eyes and they just uh, want to get deeper into the, uh, into the business model. So if you got all that and you need to give 90, 9%, 10%, 13% of your equity against that, you might think it's nothing because you're just starting, but when you get going, that makes a big difference. So my take is that it's probably 1% of accelerators that are like, like really worth You take Y Combinator, Techstars, and others, and then, I mean, if I could take any of my startups there, I would sign tomorrow, okay? We have one of my com our companies in Waira, in Telefonica, because they have this huge sales channel where they can put my company in the whole Telefonica network. Not for the mentors, not for the space. I have an office, you know? So just, I'm not saying accelerators are good or bad. Just get the best ones or don't go for that. Great. That was my take on, on accelerators. Yeah. You can take the fight outside with Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, no. Uh, Roger tells me to kill it. There is networking. There's food and drinks outside. Uh, Alvaro is staying behind. And so um, let's continue the conversation out there. Let's give Alvaro a big hand and say thank you. Oh, thank you.